St. Claude started in 1972. It's almost 41 years now. 1972, December 22nd, a huge earthquake demolished the city of Managua. Tens of thousands of people were killed. Hundreds of thousands of people were left homeless, uh, injured. Uh, and this was during the time of the Somoza dictatorship which was much more interested in how it could use the disaster to make more money for themselves than it was in uh, how they could uh, help the people recover. And a Baptist mission worker named Gustavo Panajon, who was both a pastor and a medical doctor, called together all the people that he knew in every denomination because at that point, the Protestant denominations in Nicaragua were small, not very well organized, never had done anything together. And he called together all the people he could think of to try to come up with some way of having a, a coordinated response to this. And within a week, they were serving 10,000 hot meals a day. Within three or four weeks, they were serving almost 30,000 meals a day. With the, food at first that was donated just from within the country, and then after a time began with food that was donated from uh, other countries also. No employees, they uh, made enough of attention that the President Somoza called him in and wanted to know, how are you doing this, where did you get all the money from? There's no money. They were all volunteers, all uh, donated supplies, and they really thought that they'd be together for a few months to, to handle the emergency. They discovered that you don't recover from a disaster like that in a few months. And they also discovered that they worked very well together, and uh, that they were called beyond that to do more than, uh, more than just disaster response. They also discovered that they didn't know anything about disaster response. Now, if they had waited until they learned about disaster response, they never would have done anything. And they learned a lot along the way and did a lot of things really well, made a few mistakes, obviously. But uh, that was the beginning of SEPAD. And uh, the, the acronym SEPAD has stayed. The original name was the Protestant Committee to Aid the Victims. Comité Evangelica para Ayudar a los Damnificados. Well, they've changed the name and expanded their mission, but they've kept the, the CEPAD acronym. For those who are not familiar with where Nicaragua is, as you go south from Mexico, you get to Guatemala, which has a major Pacific coast and almost no Atlantic coast because this part is Belize. Then you get to Honduras, which has a big Atlantic coast and almost no Pacific coast because this part is El Salvador. When you get to some place that has a reasonable amount of coast on both sides, you're in Nicaragua. And the other distinguishing factor or feature is the lakes. The larger of those lakes is on roughly the same size as Lake Ontario. Mm -hmm. It's the largest body of water, fresh water, between the Great Lakes and Lake Titicaca on the Peru-Bolivian border, mm -hmm. which uh, mm -hmm. is a wonderful resource and like every other resource comes with its own particular set of problems. The area that you see there, where there's colors, the brighter colors, each of those departments has an office of CEPAD in it. The other areas, there are pastoral committees in those cities in those areas that are doing some things but there's not an organized office of paid employees of Saipan. And um, that area, however, even though it's less than half of the ge geography, is at least two-thirds of the population <coughs> is covered in that area. Now, Maris Albuquerque is our executive director. She's not one of the originals with Saipan with 40 years. She's only got about 32 or 3 years. Uh, but there are some people still working who were part of that first meeting, 40, almost 41 years ago. As a council of churches, everything that we do, meetings are open and closed and, and 
discussion and voting is done all in the context of, of prayer as a council of Christian churches. United not by theology, the, or not by worship style. We have the Episcopalians and the Moravians that were uh, fairly formal, and then we have Assembly of God and Pentecostal groups. So it's not theology and it's not having worship all the same. It's simply knowing that what we're called to do is to help poor folks, and to help the dog. And that's what, what unites the body. Long-term programs that kind of exist and have for a long time and the series of community programs. Radio station is one of the long-term programs that reaches all of that area that you saw as a colored area there, except for some of the deepest valleys and the whole Pacific Coast as well. Um, so it reaches at least three quarters of the population. The high school in Leon. We are also the contracting agency for the United Nations High Commission on Refugees. And Blanca Fonseca, the young woman there who I was translating for in that photo, she's an employee of the UN High Commission on Refugees, but works in our office and Sepad provides uh, the, the support for her. You don't really think of Nicaragua, a country of poor as Nicaragua, being a country that gets a lot of refugees. But what we find is people from South America, particularly Colombians, who are trying to work their way north to the United States and get caught in Nicaragua. Africans who have found it easier to come across to South America and work their way up north. Mm. And within the last couple of years, since the, the coup in Honduras three years ago, um, there, have been, there are now 75 women and, with their families in uh, Nicaragua coming as refugees from Honduras after their husbands have been murdered because of being journalists or labor organizers or campesino <laughs> organizers, any of those things that get people murdered very, very fast in a, in a coup police state. We have a, our own farm up in the Matagalpa area, where we, we sometimes bring groups there to learn about Nicaragua, but we also have groups of Nicaraguan farmers from different areas who can come there and see what they've done to develop that farm and look at how they might do some of those same kinds of things to, uh, to conserve soil and water on their own land. There's also a meeting room on that farm which is used by Sepad and open for use to the community. This one happens to be a meeting of uh, one of the partnerships. We are currently facilitating 16 partnerships between churches or groups of churches in the U.S. and churches or communities or groups of communities in Nicaragua. Partnerships that are long-term and uh, most of them start by committing to visit for a five-year period um, and then renewable after that. Not necessarily a financial thing, although that often finds its way into it, but a partnership of really learning about and caring about each other as fellow, fellow Christians and fellow human beings. This woman started to go to Nicaragua when that teenage girl was eight years old and has been coming down every year for that amount of time. And we have delegations like the ones that you have set down that do a variety of things. Uh, some of them do construction work. Some of them bring uh, doctors, nurses, as, as you folks have done. Some of them do pro projects with kids. And some of them just like to play with kids because there's always kids hanging around. I think the heart of the program that St. Bide is doing now is in the community-based programs. If you remember that map, there were six different colored blocks there where there's a St. Bide office. Each of those has a circuit of what was originally planned to be seven communities. One of those groups snuck in an eighth community, and that's why we have 43 instead of 42. That circuit of communities 
that is engaged in a six-year process of development, and you know from the beginning that it's a six-year process. So don't develop a dependency on what, say, Pod's going to do, because six years from now, we're not going to be there. We're going to go on somewhere else. Use the time to learn what you can do. Start with electing, in each community, a community development committee elected by as wide a representation from the community as we can possibly put together. Insisting that it include both men and women, that it include both uh, long-time established leaders and younger leaders. We push toward and usually get both Catholics and Protestants. In a few places, we've gotten both former Sandinista soldiers and former Contra soldiers on the committee. Those are rare because as those armies were disbanded, the Contras tended to settle in one area and the Sandinistas tended to settle in another area. And also because it's hard to sit in a committee meeting and work alongside with people that you used to shoot at and who used to shoot at you. So, but we have some of those. We have a couple of committee, communities where people in the committee know that that their battalions were in some of the same battles. SEPAD's program of peacemaking during the war and immediately after the war was amazing. One of the things that we get into then, once you've got this group organized, they begin to get some training, they begin to make a list of the needs of their community. And you can fill the whole wall with newsprint with the needs of the community. And then the question is, what resources do you have to meet those needs? We're a poor community. We don't have any resources. What resources do you have? Because what's the most important resource that any community's got? People. Exactly. And not people who are going to come from, from the U.S. for two weeks or people who are going to come from Managua once every six weeks. People who are there in the community. And once they begin to realize that, then they can begin to look for what other resources we need from other places. The community that this photo was taken from had a visit from a church in South Carolina. And they talked about, we need a community center. Well, how much would that cost? And they did some quick figuring and they came up with roughly $35,000. Church went back to South Carolina and three weeks later, we got a check for $35,000. And both the, check, or both the church in the U.S. and the community were really upset with SEPAD that we didn't immediately hand that money over to the community. There was no organized group within the community that could legally have a bank account. So the only thing we could do is just hand it in cash to some individual or a group of individuals or put it in one person's individual bank account, neither of which are we about to do. But there was also the question of what are you going to put into this? What, what resources do you have? If we can hire a, a builder, we can provide a lot of the labor. Okay, that's a start. We can go down to the river and dig sand and get the municipality to loan us a truck to haul the sand up. Okay. Well, we want stone from this beam on down, but from there on up, we could uh, use adobe and we could make our own bricks. Okay. So they, they put those resources of their own into the community. And they saved a lot of money in the process of building their community center. And the reason for the stove picture, in Nicaragua, there is a program that if the community will build a kitchen next to the school, have families that will guarantee that it's stocked with wood, and families who will take turns cooking the food, they will provide the food for a lunch at the school. And at that time, there was the beginning of a kitchen with walls about this high near the school, and they never had the money to finish it. With what they saved on their community center, they were able to finish their building, their kitchen, and, and start giving a meal to their kids. But what they learned in the process was not just the importance of the meal for their kids, they already knew that. What they learned 
was their capability of using their resources to begin to solve some of their own problems. We do a lot of agricultural programs, as some of you who have been there know, that a lot of the people in that area, many people grew up as field hands on a single crop plantation, bananas or used to be cotton, and they may know a lot about chopping sugar cane but they don't know a lot about subsistence farming on a hillside this steep. And so you go in there and you start cutting everything down and hacking everything away and then it rains and all your topsoil runs off. And helping people learn to do things of soil and water conservation. We've got a nursery there of, of coffee trees and the A-frame apparatus there, this is a very high-tech item. You can see there is a carpenter's line level taped onto that board. You start it out on a place where it's perfectly level and put the, the level on to make sure that it's level. Then you go out into the field and you set it down and you move on one corner and you move it around like this until you find a level place. Mark a stake there and then move over and do it again until you have a contour line that follows the level curve around the, the shape of the hill. And you build a barricade there, and that means the water washes dirt that far and no further. The line of sticks and stones there in front of that group follows one of those, mm -hmm. those level barricades. And within a year, that will start to fill up. And they can make the line higher and higher as they need to doing a lot of composting, which there's always somebody there who will tell you, you need this fertilizer and this pesticide and this herbicide, and I'll be glad to sell it to you. And uh, learning that composting, organic fertilizer, really works fairly well. The fellow with the backpack on over on this side of the agronomist who works for SEPAD, that's Salvador Lopez, Antonio Hernandez is pointing off at some of his stuff there. Antonio told us the story of when he started working with CEPAD on the, um, the, the work of doing this kind of organic agriculture. The first couple of years, it's a lot of work. And Antonio lives in an area that is, I think, the worst land for growing anything that I have ever seen anywhere. It's sandy, it doesn't hold moisture. Um, I've been there times when it's been raining and muddy in the morning and dust flying in the afternoon. And nobody grows anything but corn and they dump a bunch of chemicals on it to get anything at all out. And when Antonio started working with Sepad, he told us how his neighbors stood out in the road and laughed at him. You're crazy, man. Why are you working so hard? You're never going to get a decent crop off of this. You know that the... And several people in the community laughed at And he admits that the first year it was a lot of work and there were some days when he thought, maybe I am crazy. <laughs> but this past year, when he was harvesting, some of those same neighbors came and said, can you show me how you did that? <laughs> And Sepad has trained a couple of those uh, Antonios in every one of those 43 communities who has learned those techniques and are passing them on to their neighbors, passing along seeds and plant cuttings and working to improve not only the crop that, that can be used for, for basic food, the diversity of crop that can be used for improved nutrition, and a little bit extra to sell for other needs. So, and there's a couple of Antonios in every one of those 43 communities. Family development programs, the woman in the orange dress is an educator or a psychologist who has worked for years on issues of domestic violence. The women come together and share stories and find out that, oh, other people are having the same kind of an experience that I'm having and they don't talk about it either, because I don't ever talk about it. And sharing those and finding some mutual support in that. They're also in the family development program. There are programs working with kids 
training young adults to recognize some of the signs of abuse and neglect in little children and provide activities for them. Art, craft, sports, whatever activities, just, not, we're not trying to do psychological counseling, but just to give them a respite from that. That's a weird photo to uh, illustrate a, a bank. There, there's the women's banks. And in each of these communities, there's a small amount of money, and the five or six women who have been involved in it, they decide which one of us is going to get the first loan. And the payback is not to say pod, but it's to that group so that my neighbor can get her loan next. And the woman used to buy a couple of pounds of sugar and a little bit of milk and make a wonderful caramely fudge they call cajeta and sell it there around the community. With her loan, she bought 50 pounds of sugar, enough milk, and a couple of big plastic containers and made a huge batch of cajeta, which she could take on the bus to Managua and sell as a bunch to the, to the dealers who sell the stuff piece by piece in the market. And by doing that a couple of times, she was able to pay back her loan and have enough money to continue doing it. Except that I was in there with a group, a group of US people the day that batch was made, and that batch did not make it to Monaco. <laughs> <laughs> and the final piece of it is in strengthening pastoral leadership, because in these rural communities, the, the real leadership comes through the churches. Those are the only organized groups in the community. And pastors and church leaders come together and pray together and study things together. Over the years, St. Pod has uh, produced a series of uh, booklets on the life of Jesus, the life and ministry of Paul, history of the Old Testament, also church management things, tithing and stewardship, how to run a church meeting, organizational. Also things like counseling and issues of alcohol and drug abuse, domestic violence. The most recent ones being on conflict resolution and environmental stewardship. And groups in the community, groups of pastors and lay leaders will study these and then once every six or eight weeks get together as a cluster of seven communities with someone from the state by the staff who who helps with their money. Doc, you're talking about uh, the soil that one area being really, really sandy. Is that uh, the predominant soil type? Or? No. I can't imagine that any of it is really that good. But. Oh, the, yeah, there actually, um, there are some volcanic regions where the soil is excellent. Really, really very nutritious soil. This is an area that uh, geologically at one time, according to geologists, this piece here is the last bit of Central America to push up out of the ocean, however million, many million years ago. And this water here was part of the Pacific Ocean. And where Antonio lives is this area. So it's, it's what a million years ago was a beach. And now it's been used, it was used through about 40 years of the 20th century for one crop continuously over and over again, cotton. And cotton, I read not too long ago that 4% of the arable land in the world is planted in cotton and 25% of the world's agricultural chemicals are used on cotton. Mm -hmm. And so, that area has been badly depleted by doing cotton on it over and over and over again till the cotton blight then came and destroyed everything. Um, but it's also, it was not good so to begin with. So, thank you. Yeah, we heard that when we went down the first time in the 90s, mother's milk had the highest concentration of DDT in the world in Nicaragua because they spray the cuts to be Yeah, yeah.
Saipan right now has about 62 or 3 paid employees. Um, no idea how many volunteers. In the offices, they're all paid employees, but when you get out into the, into the community projects, there are people who spend huge amounts of time on say five projects as volunteers. Because we, we met um, we had Al Castillo at Dillywood. He was a leader in mm -hmm. um, Bilasco. Mm -hmm. But um, it seemed like he spent a lot of time mm -hmm. um, you know, working on the development of the community. Yep. But also had to run his own farm. So yes. Yeah. I wondered like he he was not paid so. Oh. And there are people like that in every one of the communities who are doing their own work and spending a huge amount of time working through Saipad for the development of their community. And he's, he's a good example of it. What is your relationship with governmental systems? And I'm asking that question, uh, I love the way you started by saying uh, we found out that we work best when we work together. <laughs> what a wonderful concept, <laughs> except there are some people who don't like that because it gets in their way. Yeah. Uh, your it, whole setup. It's hard right? for me to make a lot of money out of what all of you want to be involved too. <laughs> <laughs> but it just seems to me that your whole structure, uh, the way in which you bring together representative groups, bring together sides that differ, uh, bring together different perspectives and work together is kind of contrary to what a financial system would like if it wants anything for itself. Where, yeah. where do the rough places get? Well, St. Pod's got a history that goes back for, as I said, almost 41 years. The first of that time was during the time of the Samosa dictatorship. Um, and Samosa knew about Sepad. At one time, um, there was a delegation from the U.S. Senate coming down to look at human rights issues. This was when Carter was threatening to cut off aid to uh, Samosa. And Samosa called into his office, someone from the Archdiocese Office of Human Rights and Dr. Potter Holmes. And he explained to them that this delegation from the U.S. Senate is coming and you're going to tell them that there are no human rights problems in Nicaragua. And uh, <laughs> Dr. Potterhorn uh, told how he went <clears throat> and said, we'll have to tell them what we see and did. And that was a very rocky relationship. Um, during the time of the revolution, there was a very good working relationship with the Sandinistas, and during the 11 years that the Sandinistas were in office, they had a very good working relationship. But still standing separate from. And I think that's the important piece, that they, they could they could say, yes, the Sandinistas are doing wonderful things in this area and this area. But they could also step back enough to say, but you're screwing up here. And, and it takes the same kind of courage of someone who can say this to, to the 44-year dictatorship, we'll tell them what we see, to, set, to tell the government of your friends, you're doing really well, you're doing really well, you're screwing up here. And uh, Dr. Panahone was a rare individual who could do that. And he brought together with him in Saipan other rare individuals who could continue that. Um, when the Sandinistas were voted out of office and during the 16 years of the elected Chamorro, Arnaldo Aleman and Enrique Bolaño government, I don't think that anybody from the government ever responded to a letter from Sepad during that entire 16-year period. It's totally ignored. When the Sandinistas came back in, were voted back in, the relationship exists again, and in, in the same way that Sepad has not hesitated to 
to point out the places where, where the road is rocky and where it's not going well. I think I've heard it all the way through what you've been saying, but I want to ask you to say in your own words, uh, why do you do what you do for so many years? Because I've been having the best time of my life. Um, yeah, it's... Um, some, sometimes I say that I feel called to it, felt called to it. Other times I say that I finally stopped finding excuses for not doing what I've been called to do for a long time. It kind of brought together a lot of different things that I had learned by doing other things at various points in my life and just became a, a wonderful growing opportunity for me to, to spend 10 years there. And you know, I think, I see this in the groups that go down. People go down there thinking, I'm gonna do good things to help those people. But you come back realizing this, this did good things for me.